I am, there we go, I'm all set. First, I just want to thank Carl for that kind introduction, and I want to thank the Envision Shelter Network for asking me to speak this morning to all of you. My husband and I, Scotty, have been supporters of the Envision Shelter Network for years. And the question is, why? There are a lot of organizations out there, very worthwhile nonprofits out there to support and to be involved with. Why the Shelter Network Envision? And I'll be honest with you, when I was asked to speak, I started to reflect on that. You know, why is it? What is so compelling or what created the tie and the draw for us to indeed get involved? And it actually forced me to reflect, to reflect back kind of on my life and what is that pull? And what I determined is that it really is at a very foundational, fundamental level. So what I want to do this morning is talk to you about that. And I thought the best way to do that was to share a little bit of background so that you'd understand what drove that. Now, the story I'm going to share is a very condensed one, but it's also a very personal one. And frankly, one that I've never told before. So very emotional as I was thinking about what I'm sharing. So realize I'm up here kind of pouring it out to all of you this morning. <laughs> As I look at this audience, I see a lot of business associates, I see colleagues, friends, people I've had a chance to meet. But frankly, most of you I haven't had the opportunity to meet. So what you know about Shelley is what you read in the program or what Carl just described. Right? You see a woman up here, a successful businesswoman who's built a company that's now a leader in her space who has indeed demonstrated the experience and the skill set to be elected to the Board of Directors for Verizon, a Fortune 15 company, a woman who takes time and energy to actually give back to the community in a number of ways. Right? That's, what, that's what you see. Some of you I've worked with in some form or fashion, and so you actually know a little bit more of my story, and you know that I've overcome a number of challenges and obstacles in my career. For example, Metric Stream, 10 years ago, Metric Stream was a, a broken company, is the best way to describe it. They were hemorrhaging money. They had de minimis sales. Most of the investors in the firm had actually written it off, literally had written it off. And I was hired to fix it. So you might say, first of all, why did I take that job? <laughs> That's a story for another time. Bottom line is I did take the job. And with the help of a great team that we built over time, we were able to take that broken company and turn it into a recognized market leader in governance, risk, and compliance. We were able to turn it into an organization that actually employs over 1,300 people around the world. We were able to turn it into a company that serves hundreds of clients globally. So that company, has indeed risen, right, and grown. But for me, right, what you see in front of you is a woman that you might describe as being poised, calm under pressure, someone who can indeed get to the crux of an issue and solve the problems, someone who can build a team, motivate them, and frankly, bring out the best in people. Standing here today, you see Shelley Archambault is probably smart, capable, and confident, I'd be described as. It wasn't always that way. It wasn't always that way. Let me tell you a story. First, to do that, you have to go back. Now, I look around this audience, and some of you will actually remember this period of time. Let's go back to the 60s. All right, the 60s. What are we talking about in the 60s? Music. Simon and Garfunkel, right? You've got the Beatles are playing. You have the Mamas and the Papas, right? You have a number of Marvin Gaye's out there playing. You've got a time of a lot of social and political upheaval going on. You've got the Vietnam War on one hand, and you've got the anti-war movement. You have the rise of feminism and women stepping up and going after their rights. You have civil rights movement out there. But you also have a period of time when you have the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, 
Martin Luther King Jr. It's a time when there were as many proponents for civil rights as there were detractors. And it was during this time, you hear the music playing in the background, you see the people, everybody's got a cause. It was during this crazy time, this time of upheaval, that a little girl, a little black girl, and her family moved from Philadelphia to a far out suburb of LA. They moved to a, what you could probably call an upper middle class neighborhood. Her parents really struggled and stretched to buy the cheapest house they could find in a neighborhood with the best schools so she could get a great education. But what this meant was when she showed up at school, it looked very, very different from that Philadelphia City school that she used to belong to. In the late 1960s, she had challenges to face. So here's this little elementary school girl. Walks to school, because everybody walks to school, but she walks along a road called Balboa Boulevard. Now Balboa Boulevard, and just for a short stretch, but long enough, Balboa Boulevard was very much like El Camino Real in terms of the amount of traffic that was happening there. Now you didn't have all the stores and the shops. It was really on the edge of a residential neighborhood, but just as much traffic, which means there were just as many drivers and those drivers, when they saw this little girl walking to school every day, would take those opportunities to roll down their windows and yell hateful and hurtful things at her, making her understand in no, uncircum no uncertain circumstances that she really wasn't welcome and she just didn't belong. And she walked that stretch every day to school and every day coming home by herself. That walk, that walk was long enough so that one day walking home from school, two boys from her class, two boys that she knew, actually hid in the bushes and jumped her, beating her up on her way home from school. This was a very hard environment and situation for this little girl. And for no other reason were they doing this than because she was different. Now, she was an ugly little girl. Uh, she had skin color that didn't match anybody else's. She had hair that was unruly. She had big glasses. She was kind of tall and gawky. And she knew she was ugly because, well, because that's what the kids told her, right? So here she is, one of those kids. You know, one of those kids that's like the last one picked for the team or the last one picked to join the school project. You know, one of those kids that's kind of targeted for bullying and for picking on. She still has scars on her knees to this day because of all the accidental tripping, right, and pushing that happened on the playground when she was at school. The school gave a test one day. They were instituting a gifted and talented program. And the little girl took the test because, you know, she always got good grades. And sure enough, when the list came out, she was invited to this program. And you know how it works? Every day at a certain time, the kids that go to the program leave the class and come back, et cetera, right? So she joined, finally, a group that she could belong to. And when she showed up in that group, you know that little ugly black girl? Oh, there's a problem here. You know, there was a mistake. There was a mistake. You really didn't qualify for this program. So now she wasn't in the program. And she went back to class. And now what happens? Everybody knows that she's no longer in that program, so you know what? She's probably not very smart after all. Isolated, embarrassed, feeling terrible about how she looks, definitely not confident. That was that little girl. So what happened? What happened was Mrs. Lutzinger. Mrs. Lutzinger was a third grade teacher, and she lived on a farm, a small farm, but out in the outskirts. And she offered this little girl and her mom an opportunity to take horseback riding lessons. Horseback riding lessons. Well, finally somebody was reaching out, and sure enough, every Saturday, she got up and she went and she got on the horse and she learned how to sit and she learned how to walk and how to control the horse with the reins and 
direct the horse with her legs, and soon she was not only walking, but she was trotting, and then she was cantering, and then she would go out into the fields, and ah, oh, it just felt wonderful, right? You feel the wind in your hair, and you know what? That horse, that horse didn't care what she looked like, right? That horse didn't care about how her hair looked or the glasses or anything. And it turned out she was actually pretty good. She ended up entering some horse competitions and got some ribbons. And for the first time, she started to actually feel a little pride in herself, a little confident about what she was able to do. That third grade teacher, Mrs. Lutzinger, had a big impact on that little girl. Because although she still had that long walk to and from school every day, she was able to shut it out. She was able to shut it out. And she was able to finally see through the prejudice and indeed find some open-minded kids and make some friends. That little girl, that little ugly black girl who was told she wasn't all that smart, that was me. That was me. Now, why do I tell you that story? I tell you that story not to feel bad for Shelley Archambault. That's not what this is about at all. Because many of us out here in this audience have our own little story, right, to tell. I tell you that story because the role that Mrs. Lutzinger played for me, the intervention, right, that she made, was exactly the kind of intervention, exactly the kind of help, exactly the kind of support that Envision Shelter Network provides to their clients every day. Every day. And it is that tie, that link, that relationship, of why I am such a supporter of this organization. Because I can relate. I can relate to what they do, and I can relate to their clients. All right. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know what the average client looks like that Shelter Network supports? Why don't you do me a favor? Close your eyes. No, really, really. Close your eyes. All right, close your eyes. You got them closed? Now I want you to think. In your mind, I still see some open eyes. Envision in your mind a homeless person. How old is that person? What do they look like? How are they dressed? How do they smell? What, do you have a good picture in your mind of what that person looks like? Okay, now open your eyes. Most people, when I ask that question over the last couple weeks, and I ask them, what does that person look like? That person is typically a middle-aged man, maybe woman, um, who is indeed disheveled, maybe smells a little bit, might have a little drug addiction or alcohol problem. Right? Did many of you in the audience come up with that kind of a picture in your head? Yeah. The average client that the Shelter Network, Envision Shelter Network supports is actually a school-aged child. It's a little Shelly, right? 6,000 of them last year. 6,000. That's more kids than any of your children's schools holds. That's more than... 300 people here? That's more than 20 times the people in this room. School-aged kids who are just trying to make it, just trying to fit in and find themselves. So how do they feel when they come to the shelter? How do they feel when they're homeless? They feel isolated, right? They feel uncomfortable with how they look. They don't have much confidence. You see the linkage with the story? Most of Envision Network's family clients are actually working. They are working homeless. People don't realize that either. Back to the numbers that Corey shared earlier, they have no safety net. They work paycheck to paycheck, typically. And if something happens that they don't expect, they don't have sick leave. They don't get paid when they get sick. They don't have vacation time that's paid. So any emergency, anything that takes them out of the office so that they don't get paid is tragic to them. And suddenly they can't pay their rent and they're homeless. But then they can't catch up 
They can't catch up because they can't save up the deposit to get back in, right, to homes. Envision provides, the Envision Shelter Network provides not just shelter, which Corey talked about, but they also provide the ability for these people to actually gain their dignity back. Because when a family shows up at Envision Shelter Network, you heard some from Katie, they get not only housing and they get not only the ability to save money, but they also get a place to live. And oh, by the way, this place is actually staged. They take all those donations that you provide, the couches and the towels and the pots and the pans, and they actually set up these apartments. So when the people walk in, they feel good about where they're staying, right? They feel good about what they're staying. And more than that, they've got closets. Think of it as these large rooms where they take all the clothing that you donate, and they literally put them on hangers, they fold them nicely, they organize them by style, et cetera, and so the people can go in and actually shop for free clothing. They have, cl they have they, what they call the pantry, right? A great big room where they have all the foods laid out. You can come in and, quote, shop for food so that you can actually cook and create your own meals and actually take control of your life. And it's that control, it's that being treated like a person that gives these folks their dignity and the support to be able to go forward, right, in life. And that's what Envision Shelter Network does more than any other organization. And as Corey said, when they leave, 90% find their permanent housing home. But more than finding their permanent home, they actually get to take all those furnishings in the apartment they had temporary, they get to take that with them. So now they actually have something in this home. Think about how that makes them feel. I'm a supporter of Envision Shelter Network because I know how impactful a single intervention, a single meaningful, tangible touch, right, or, sh or demonstration that you care can be on someone. Because as that little, ugly black girl who wasn't that smart, who's now standing before you as a successful businesswoman, actually making a contribution to society. I know that there are thousands, 6,000 children last year, that we can all touch in our own way and make a difference so that we can help all those Shelleys, all those Katies, all those people out there to be able to do show and demonstrate their capabilities and frankly give back to society, which is what it's all about. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you for listening to me this morning. I want to thank you for hearing my story. And I hope in some way I've touched you or this program today has touched you so that you can, too can relate to what the Envision Shelter Network is doing. Thank you very much for this time this morning.